Hello and welcome to another Broken Meeple video and if you want to talk hardness, this is definitely one of the hardest titles to have been released around SN time. Not the most hyped game of the year, we've already got a, a certain Stonemaier title to thank for that, but uh, more on that in a future review. But Maracaibo is definitely one that's been hitting the hardness charts because of one name and one name only, Mr. Alexander Fister. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, when it comes to Alexander Fister, you think Great Western Trail, Mombasa, Blackout, and uh, Oh My Goods, Isle of Sky, you know, some of those games in my collection. Granted, most of them have been the lighter ones, but still. You know, but you talk about his name and people will instantly praise whatever two, three, maybe even six, seven of their games that he likes. You know, he's definitely a very popular designer and fair play. Maracaibo is one of his heavier titles that he's put out. It's kind of on the same levels as a uh, Great Western Trail, Mombasa, Blackout, that kind of thing. I, you know, I've whether I do this video first or New Dale first, I don't know, but I think New Dale is the kind of midweight one, and then the others are heavyweight. This is definitely in that heavyweight category. We're talking two to three hours minimum to play the game. We're talking quite a fair few options, and certainly something that rewards, you know, multiple plays, and more on that later. But in Maracaibo, you are in 17th century sort of colonial eras and you are sailing your ship around the Caribbean, you know, performing certain feats and doing various objectives. The idea is that each round is meant to be a decade of your career, though there is an amusing thing about that and more on that later. But the idea is, is that you have these project cards. And with these cards, they're multi-use and they can be used to, as delivering goods. They can be used as fulfilling quests, which is basically cash in, do a tile and get a reward. But as you sail around this map via various routes, I mean, it branches off into two paths and then sort of they meet up every now and again. But at these different places, be it a city, a village, or, you know, an end space, you effectively perform an action, a main action and some free ones. But what main action you can do depends on where you are. There's city actions, there's assistant actions from people that you've actually played out of your cards. There's quest tiles that you can complete. There's also village actions. If you don't go to a city, you can do village actions, which do something else. As you go through the game, your ship player board has various upgrades that you can you know, remove discs from it in order to trigger upgrade abilities that might make certain actions more powerful, or make uh, give you some money, some victory points, that kind of thing. But you can do quite a few different things in this game to get victory points at the end, which of course, most wins. Of course! But how do you get those points? Do you want to play a ton of cards and hope they get you points? Do you want to play assistant cards, which make you put meeples on the board and allow you to do different actions at different locations? Get lots of them out, you can get some victory points for their actions as well as just skipping them. Do quest tiles. The more quest tiles you get, the more victory points you could earn from those. Uh, combat. You are able to ally with France, Spain, or England in various wars or battles that they do. And in doing so, there's kind of like a side mini game where you fight alongside one another nation, find a combat value, and then spend that combat value a la kind of action point allowance symbol. Think like Pandemic, basically. And you spend those points on performing other actions. Gain influence with the nations, make them own various cities and villages on the board, and the more you do that, you you know, you could generate more points at the end of the game for it. You know, if you're very influential with a nation that owns half the board, then you're in a pretty good state at the end game. Whereas if you, you know, you're very influential with somebody who literally owns one village, then chances are it's not gonna get you a huge amount of points. But you know, there's quite a lot of options that you have in this game, and that's certainly a plus point. You know, you can take multiple paths to victory. There's easily at least a good, say, four paths to victory that are, like, pretty easy to spot. And then there's a few more sort of sub-paths to victory that you get from those project cards. And the project cards, uh, well, actually, before I get into this, let's just get one thing clear, okay? Particularly from, like, Facebook groups and board game group, geek, geek groups I'm on. I do, shock horror, like this game. What? Yeah, I do like it, but sorry, it's not going to be like a 10 out of 10 rating here. There are issues with this game, and we'll get onto those later. But let's start on a high positive note. The cards, the project cards, they're easily my favorite part of this game. Multi-use cards is a mechanic I adore. It might even be my favorite mechanic ever. You know, where you have a card that can do anything from, say, preferably at least three things, possibly even more, and you have to decide with the hand what you're going to do with it. You know, am I going to play it as an actual character? Am I going to discard it to deliver a good to this city and upgrade my ship? Am I going to trade it in as part of a quest action? 
I think they're the three main things that you do with them effectively, but three things is quite hard choices because, you know, delivering goods is handy. That's how you upgrade your ship and get those cool other abilities. But then quest tiles could get you points. If you're aiming for quests, you're going to have to hunt down specific goods on those cards. But then if you're more concerned about the cards themselves, then how much do they cost in money to buy? What abilities do they give you? Are they assistants where you can go visit them or are they different cards? You know, and it's a lot of cool choices that you have to make with these cards and you burn through them quite quickly. You know, you can literally go to a village and do an action to discard your whole hand for money and then draw back up to your hand size, which can be upgraded with the ship. So you're not gonna be stuck with a hand of cards that you can't do anything with. You wanna get shot of it, Boo! go, get some money and draw more cards and see what you do. So there's an element of strategy in this game because you do kind of want to focus on a path and stick with it. If you try to do everything, you're kind of going to suffer. But you certainly do have a tactical edge to the fact that when you draw these cards, both from a deck and a face-up display if you're willing to pay the money, then you can come across some cards that you think, oh, that'd be good to play instead of the one that I just did, you know, or, oh, hang on, there's one there that's got the uh, sugarcane good on there, I could do with him, you know. So the card's easily my favourite aspect, even though there is a slight graphic design issue I have with them, which we'll get onto in a minute. But love them, you know, really solid. Another thing is that the game actually looks pretty good on the table. It's got a pretty hefty table presence, I'll admit. It's got a big board, you've got cards around that board, you've got this player board in front of you, you're gonna need somewhere to put your tableau of cards, you need somewhere to put all of like money and stuff like that. It's quite a table hog, this one, okay? You're gonna have to deal with it with a big table. But it's colorful. You know, you've got a very nice uh, you know, setting with blue ocean, green forest land, islands, white, yellow, and red, I'm sorry, white, red, and blue, you know, being three very distinct colors that, you know, go well together. It's a very pretty game, and the box is not bad either. I mean, the cover doesn't exactly scream out, you know, mass thematic game here, but uh, it's a decent enough cover, and it would make you pass by and go, Hmm, okay, you know, let's have a look at this. So, you know, definitely got props for visual appeal and definitely for those multi-use cards and obviously definitely for the strategic aspect. But there's a, there's a double-edged sword with that. Now, to move on to a more negative aspect, component quality I'm a little bit uh, less keen on. You know, cubes, whatever, it's cubes. Cubes are cubes, you know, they're just there. But there are a few graphic design choices and a few component choices where I'm just like, not, I'm not just disliking them, I'm physically angry with them. Like angry rant level angry. You know, you have a player board here with a bunch of upgrades on them. How do you upgrade them? You remove these discs from there. Well, it doesn't sound too bad, they did in Great Western Troll. Yet yeah, these discs are about this big, they're brown and you stack two on every single space that you can upgrade and remove one at a time. You have 24 of these on your board. Believe me, those discs get annoying fast. <laughs> There's no other way that this could have been done. They are fiddly as all get out and you're gonna hear that word a bit more in the future. On top of that, the cards themselves, the artwork's okay, it's not nothing to sing home about, but the card quality just feels a bit lacking here. You know, it doesn't matter, I mean, if you sleeve them, you're going to need a lot of sleeves, you know, there's a lot of cards there, sleeving them is going to cost you a pretty penny, but I recommend you probably do, because if you don't, even just slightly greasy fingers, even just slightly sweaty fingers, you're going to notice it on the cards, and there's uh, some of them that have already started looking a little scuffed on the edges from just a few games of play, you know, let alone the amount of games I've played of this already, it's like... Oh, do I? Maybe I should sleeve it, but I don't want to buy all the sleeves necessary to do so, especially when you're going to need to, uh, well, another problem with it is that the card size seems a bit off. You know, there's reports of the card being a little bit too, a little bit too wide, you know, wider than a typical size card, which means that you need to get a very specific size of sleeve in order for it to work. So I've just got to the point where I'm like, okay, fine, I can't be bothered to sleeve it, but then of course, the card quality, it's not going to last a huge amount of time. Yeah, the tiles themselves are fine, you know, the rest of the components are okay. To be honest, probably the best component in this is the board itself, you know, just for the fact that it looks nice and it's a decent sturdy board. But otherwise, the component quality is not as cool. But the graphic design choices, what? <laughs> it's like, you know, it's not that there's anything too confusing in the game from like an intuitive perspective. But there's just, again, some graphical design choices I just don't get. You know, the 
worst of the defenders being this rope colour. All the cards have got a rope border, and the idea is, is that there's A and B cards. You use all the A cards, but you use a certain amount of B cards and you mix them all together. How do you tell them apart? Well, would you be nice if there was a big letter on the game? No. <laughs> Agricola did it, but this one doesn't. Nope, there's no A and B on the cards. It's done with a rope border. One is dark brown, the other one is a slightly lighter brown. That's it. So, you're shuffling through these cards, you're tired, you've played a long game, or you've come from work, or maybe the lighting's not perfect or something, and you're trying to separate these cards based on a brown rope border. Yeah, what is this obsession with brown in this game? Brown discs, brown borders on cards. It's a bit of a pain to have to sift through the cards. You know, could any other bit of graphic design have worked better? You know, but, yeah, you know, those things aside, they irk me, and they are negatives, but they don't destroy the game outright. They just make a otherwise good game a bit more fiddly to play than it should be. And certainly, fiddly is one name I would give to it. Now, this is a personal opinion, and there's a few people out there that will agree, and there's quite a few that won't. Although I do question that if you don't think this game has some fiddly aspects, I can only imagine that your definition of the word fiddly is to balance the game on your head while you're playing it. Because that's the only way it would make sense to me. But, you know, because you've got to mess around with those little discs, one nudge of the table and you're screwed with those discs. And uh, you've got the, you know, the fact that you've got to separate those cards by just a brown rope. You know, you've got cubes that are in this, like, arranged order and you knock it and then you go, oh, hang on, let's line them all up again. You've got scoring from lots of different ways at the end of the game, one of which is like this little mathy you know, thing of, all right, I've got, hang on, I've got a ranking influence of six, therefore how many cubes are revealed? That's five, gets a two bonus, so that's six times seven, so that's 42, let me just add 42 on. Right, let's repeat this another two times for me. Now we do it another three times per player, okay. You know, and another component missing, where's the 100 and 200 point victory point marker? There isn't one. Surely you can't be serious. I am serious, and don't call me Shirley. You go around the board 100 points, and you should do every single game, at least break 100, you know, 200 in some respects, and you've got no way to track it. So I'm balancing cubes on a shield marker as it goes round, trying to think, hang on a minute, so 42 for that one, 67, that's got one cube, hang on, I've now just gone past that, and I need to get a second cube, hang on, let me just put that one on there, oh my god! It's infuriating at times. You know, and it just... It just has those like little fiddly aspects that don't destroy the game at all. They really don't. And I mean, in fact, one I even forgot about, the combat. The combat, as I said, it was its own little mini game. This is another example of throwing mechanics into a game to make them stick. I mean, Great Western Trail has deck building, you know, New Dale has like secret objectives that are kind of pointless. This one has instead the combat mini game, which is basically a whole game mechanic in this side thing. It's a pretty important side thing, I'll give it that. But, you know, you flip a combat tile and then you have to think, right, okay, who owns the most cubes on the board? Okay, uh, he's got seven, he's got eight, and he's got seven as well. So it's England. Uh, let's see, the first one, England gets a bonus. Right, now, who are you going to side with? France, Spain, or England? Well, France gets six, he gets four. Um, I get an extra one for being with Spain, so that's a five, actually. England was a two, but I get a plus three, so that's five. And now, okay, so I got to spend, the, and I'm going to spend some action points on my board. That'll give me ten. Now I'm going to spend those ten. Okay, well, let's see. I could do this action. That's worth four. That triggers that. And then this action's worth two. I'll spend two action points that way. And then I could afford five with this bonus one. My God, it's like its own game in its own right. You know, it's like you got to kind of pause the game for a bit while this one person hurries up and sorts out their combat action. And repeatedly, no matter how well I teach it, no matter how well the book explains it. And to be fair, the rule book's actually reasonably decent. I've read better, but to be fair, apart from maybe being a bit hard to reference rules during a game at times, it was actually not too difficult to read the rules and actually learn the game to teach it. But, you know, when people get explained the combat thing, it usually takes them a little while before they get that bit. That's easily been the hardest aspect to, for other people to understand. And like I say, I've taught it to people. I've even let them just simply read the book and find out for themselves. Both occasions, there's always been at least one, if not two, people who take a little bit longer to get that combat mechanic. You know, it, it took me about a game or so to go, oh, right, so yeah, that's how it's working. Right, 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 right. You know, it didn't take me too long, but it's a different story for people, particularly if you're not used to a heavy game. 
Now, you know, those fiddly aspects aside, the game is still fun to play. You know, I enjoy having these different options and paths that I can go for, even though if you go on Board Game Geek, there's quite a few discussion threads about it. I would argue that I think quest tiles are a bit weak, that going for solely quest tiles is not going to get you enough points, especially when it relies on you getting cards with compass symbols on them. And despite the fact that you can churn through the cards pretty quickly, there is still a luck of the draw factor. You just may never see those draw tiles everywhere. And even worse with the uh, synergy tokens, where you've got these uh, tokens where the cards will give you more income, victory points or money, based on if you've got a certain token in front of you. You might have a bunch of cards that require the anchor symbol and you never see a card with that gives you an anchor symbol. Someone else has drawn it, you don't have the money to buy it when it comes up, and then you've just got a bunch of stuff with wasted powers on. That gets pretty infuriating when that happens. But, and on top of that, adding to the fiddly aspect, as soon as you get one of those tokens, you've then got to think, well, hang on a minute, this card adds four now, so that's added four, that's adding another four. Um, if I get that token, oh, I've got this token, so that adds another two. It's like, there's a lot of, it's a very mathy thinking game, I think, this one. You know, and like I say, it's a heavy game. You've got to expect it to have some element of that, but it, what this game doesn't feel is smooth. It feels fun. I enjoy it. But it doesn't feel like it's as smooth flowing as something like, say, Terramara and other ones like that that I've played recently. You know, those feel very elegant and smooth. This one feels like it kind of, almost a bit like a, like a modern hybrid car or something with a stop-start thing or something. It, it's kind of like, has to stop-start every now and again to keep going. <laughs> But it's not too bad. Again, I have played a lot worse in terms of fiddly games. But there's just, I feel like some of those aspects didn't need to be there. You know, they could have been streamlined a bit more. Um, but the, the double-edged sword I mentioned earlier is I like the whole strategic element of going around, deciding, you know, what you're going to do in terms of these cards and how fast you're going to move. That's a double-edged sword in itself. You know, it's cool to sort of think, well, hang on a minute, if I go fast, then the other players don't get time to do their various actions. But can I do what I need to do with only three or four stops around? But this is an engine building game, sort of. <laughs> it feels like an engine building game. You know, you get these cards, you put them out, you start off with an engine and you try and keep it going. But if you imagine that an engine building game typically makes you think, oh, I'm building this huge locomotive and I get to see it churn round and round and round multiple times and like loads of cool stuff happens. This one feels more like you're building an engine for a scale electric car. You know, this titchy little thing, it just has to be like go round a circle a few times, really high speed. Because if everybody goes slow, which we did in our first couple of games, the game pretty much self-destructs <laughs> in the sense that the points go out of complete whack because some strategies benefit from having longer to plan for them than others. And in those games, anybody who was doing combat with lots of actions around, we were the ones that were on 250 points by the end. When you can't track 100 and 200 points, that gets really irritating, especially when you have to add the influence markers. But... You just earn so many points from those influence tracks if you've got all the time in the world to fight, fight, fight to your heart's content and gain influence that they will just steamroll the game. Now, the strategic combat against this, no pun intended, is to have someone move fast so that those players can't take their time. But it's an engine building game. It, it's hard to get into people's mindsets because the book makes no indication, there's no strategy tip in the book or anything to highlight that you should ideally not be spending too much time circling around the map. Again, this is why it re rewards repeat plays. But it just, because they don't have that, you try telling people that you should have this engine but go quickly with it. It just doesn't work. People comment saying that I don't want to move fast. I want to enjoy building up cards and having this cool tableau in front of me and doing cool stuff with them. But if you don't go fast, or at least if one person doesn't go fast, then you're going to let the combat roll away, run away with it. But then the person going fast probably doesn't feel like they're doing as much in the game. And other players have had this sort of downer feeling when somebody goes so fast around the board that they feel the games ended a bit too quickly for what they wanted to enjoy out of it. You know, it's very, it's a very hard thing to tell someone, this is an engine builder, but don't spend time building your engine. It's like, huh? <laughs> it's like, it doesn't really, 
it phases a lot of Euro players, put it that way. Now, once you've got some games under your belt, that problem kind of goes away. You know, you just need to play this more times to understand fully more about how fast you really should be going around this map. Now, that might put off some players because people might not want to move fast around the map and it might, in which case, this isn't the game for you. But if you want something a bit more tactical rather than strategic, because you might say, all right, I'm going to do high on exploring, but the cards might not give you exploring stuff. A bit like Terraforming Mars, you need to respond to what cards you get and make the best of the situation fast. And you mustn't get distracted by trying to do everything. You try to do everything in this game, you will lose, hands down. But you have to decide quickly, right, am I going assistance or am I going exploring? Well, if I'm going exploring, what do I really need? What do I really need? Well, yours, that assistant is good. I need the last action on the board. Those two cities are good. That should be it. I'll go to those four cities and I'll rinse, repeat, and we're good. But again, it's hard to get into that mindset because you want to go to this place and then this place and then this place and then this place and then this place. It's really hard to think like this. But it rewards you if you do. Like I say, multiple plays, all cool. So it's a weird one, this one. I mean, it does go on a bit long, you know, two to three hours, you know, getting closer to the three hour mark is a very long game. And you're only doing four rounds of this board. So you do feel like, oh, blimey, we've been here a while actually, unless somebody is going like Speedy Gonzalez, in which case it will end a bit quicker. Now, the other part I need to mention, and like I say, sorry that this is a longer review, but there's a lot to cover in this game. The narrative aspects. This game has a solo mode, but the solo mode basically just means play against an AI. I've played the solo mode. The AI is tough, to say the least. You've got five difficulty levels, but the rate that she gets points at the end for having more stuff than you, especially when she can do it a lot quicker than you, is pretty hefty. You know, I've beaten her, but only by the skin of my teeth. It's uh, quite a tough AI, and that's on easy mode. It goes up three levels higher than that. I want to play a game, I don't want to get punched in the face repeatedly, but there's solo mode and it's actually pretty sweet. I like the solo mode. You get to have fun with the project cards, do your own thing and get through a game reasonably quickly. I dare say the solo mode's actually more interesting than the multiplayer mode, to be perfectly honest, but it's there. Great. I love it. But the story narrative aspect is one of the key things that this game talks about. You can play a basic game, easy, medium or hard difficulty. Never play the game on the easy mode, it is boring. Medium and hard, fine. Just play it on the hard one to begin with for your first game. Because with that hard mode, you will get essentially, you know, a lot of the stuff like legacy tiles, which replace city spots on the board, you know, locations change up and stuff. And that's all cool. But you want to play that out of the gate. You don't want to play with, you know, like the easy, easy mode because it's just not as interesting. Now, what can happen though, is that you can play through a campaign of different chapters. And as you play through each game, certain things will appear on the board or you might uh, acquire different cards. And these will go in a blue bag and you'll save them from game to game. So almost kind of semi legacy. You don't tear anything up, you don't rip anything up. I mean, you could play through the campaign once and then instantly play through it again. You know, not anything major. But the narrative thing causes a few problems as well. Firstly, with this game, it feels like something that you have to play with the same group a lot. You play this with a lot of different people, like I end up having to most of the time because I go to game clubs and I teach games. I have to play with different people. Then you, people A, don't get the whole thing about moving around the map fast, no matter how well you tell them, but also you don't get a chance to really do the story aspects. Yes, you can do a chapter on its own, but doesn't really add you know a huge amount to the experience just doing a chapter on its own you kind of want to go from a to b and see the board game progress for that you're going to need a regular group some people have got that fair play to you sadly i don't always have the same three people to play this with but in terms of the story much like with newdale much like with a few other games that are in the sort of euro category the story is just there <laughs> you know this is not a rich narrative this is not going to surprise you and oh my god dun 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 you know anything like that it's just it's your atypical bland story you know things happen oh this guy's evil oh these guys attack you we need to do this whatever 
So you don't really care about the story per se, you're just more interested into, oh, oh wait, so these new cards are in the deck, okay, cool, I'd like to see them at some point, or the legacy tiles, which are easily the best aspect of the story campaign. The fact that these tiles can come onto the board and they have special rules, or they might, you know, one place that was a village suddenly becomes a city. Uh, one extra, a few paths might suddenly appear on the board that weren't there before. You know, various things can change and you're gonna see them all eventually, but at least they're there and they change up the game. It's welcome. In expansions, you could probably just add more of them and it would be pretty sweet. And if you do a standalone chapter, then you'll get to see some of them in action. But yeah, you're not really playing the story for a rich narrative. So don't come into this game thinking that you're going to get this nice story going through it. It's literally just going through the motions and seeing the board slightly evolve. That's really what the campaign is. You know, and certainly I found it fine to play in solo mode. Although, with the speed that the AI goes around the board, you kind of don't always have a lot of time to actually do the story quest tiles. And certainly theme-wise, yeah, theme is kind of questionable here. Quest tiles are literally just cashing a couple of cards, get a reward. That's it. A quest. Yes, a quest. Yeah, it's literally just a tile with a requirement and a reward. That's it. You've got an explorer track. It's literally just the dude who moves on a bunch of spaces and randomly gets money or victory points or can do another quest tile, which may or may not have any relevance. You know, it's it's just literally a track. You know, influence with the nations, you know, you choose France, Spain, or England, you're just comparing values at the end of the day. It's not like England behaves any differently to France. It's just which one do you want to do? And you end up chopping and changing your allegiances sort of several times every now and again. But uh, for the most part, you'll stick with one country because you're trying to get all the cubes off the board. And the story aspect, as I said, not particularly rich, not that immersive. So you're not really going for that. But there's one thing that does make me laugh in this. And it works brilliantly with the story. I mentioned earlier that if you remember, each round, and it says this in the rule book, that each round is a decade of your career, 10 years. The story aspects come out each round. So minor spoiler, but to be fair, what am I spoiling here? First campaign, you know, you have to protect some woman and you can go do the story quest in order to do it. And it literally just is pay a cost, get a reward, done, take the tile, might be worth points later. And then at the end of the round, you will always flip the card and you'll read the story. And it's like, oh, thank you for saving me. We should go meet this doctor friend, though, because there's a plague going on in the area and stuff like that. You meet him next round. What, did it take you 10 years to get back to him? Everything that happens now is happening now. What happened to then? We passed then. When? Just now. We're at now now. Eh? It's, like, it's, it's kind of hard to measure time in this. You know, a decade is around. But you're supposed to wait till the next round and halfway around the board before you come across this guy. So, what, it took you 10 years to beat him? And then you meet him and say, right, we need to get these survivors into this area here. That took another 10 years? What? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I don't know if that's a misprint or bad translation or something, but it makes me laugh whenever we joke in these games with other players of that, where we're saying, right, guys, 10 years later, it's, it's like SpongeBob SquarePants gone mad. 12 seconds later. I'll protect you, fine citizen. Three weeks later. We need to go meet my uncle. You know, he knows a lot about the situation. Day three. How about we go out for lunch? Many months later. I completely forgot why we came here. Six and a half hours later. That's right, lunch. Three hours later. Can you move it along? I'm all out of time cards. It just gets a little bit weird when you really, really think about it from a time perspective. Again, the, f the game is a relatively dry one, so I'm not really that fussed about it. You know, I knew it going in that this wasn't going to be the most fanatic experience ever, but I just found it quite funny that something like that slipped through the cracks. So I'd be curious to know if that actually was an error or intended, or perhaps I'm just missing something that actually justifies why each round is 10 years. I don't know. But yeah, I mean, the ship lasts a long time as well. I mean, how long does the ship normally last <laughs> when you're fighting along like colonial, like, people in France, England and that. Do they normally last 40 plus years? <laughs> Not entirely sure. So yeah, there's a few bad things I've had to say about it, mostly from a component and fiddly aspect, but I do still like this game. I do not dislike it, you know, but I can't go out there like some people thinking this is the best of 2019, because it really isn't. Not with those component and, you know, fiddly aspects, not with the fact that it's going to be very difficult for new players to understand exactly what you're supposed to do with the boat movement. You know, that is a negative. You know, yes, you can say, well, that's why you need to play it more and more with players, but not everybody is in that situation. 
you know, if you're going to play a new player with this, they're going to be at a significant disadvantage compared to everyone else. But I do enjoy the core mechanics of this game. I like the like going round, and it's not like the Great Western Trail one where you sort of get to the end and then magically teleport back while everyone else is still going round. You know, that's the weird one. But this one just feels like, okay, we get to the end, and then if you go too fast for other players, they get moved, we start a new round, fresh and go round. I like the fact that you can't go back and you have to think... Oh, but I want to go do that action, but if I move too slowly, they're going to get to do everything they need to do. I need to think about my speed. I like the variety of actions. I like the variety of paths to victory. You know, the cards can create some interesting little sub-path strategies there. I like the multi-use cards. I love multi-use cards. You know, I want to see more games utilize multi-use cards because they always give me interesting and regular choices to make. So granted, I do have some issues with a little bit of the game balance, you know, with like moving too slow, combat just steamrolls, and the quest being pretty weak, to be perfectly honest. But, and I do find some of the components and graphic design issues not just questionable, but downright insane. But I do enjoy this one. And people think I hate on every single one of Alexander Fisto's games. I really don't, all right? He's a nice guy. He's very talkative on Board Game Geek, regardless of whether you love his games or don't. He's very chatty. You know, cool, coolness to him. But I've got Isle of Sky in my collection down there with the Druids expansion. Hate the previous expansion, but love the Druids. It's a great game. Love it. I've got Broom Service right next door to it. Love Broom Service. Maybe co-designed that one, I can't remember, but it's got his name on the box and it's a really cool, light, you know, role selection game. Love it. Oh my goods, I don't own that one, but I do like it. My friends have it, so I play their copy. But yeah, that's a neat little card game as well, as well as the, uh, was it Tybor or Lannister? I forget what it was called, but they've got that one as well. You know, I enjoyed that too. You know, not the biggest fan of Port Royal, but nah, you know, it's okay, I don't mind it. The only ones that I technically really dislike is Great Western Trail. Sorry, I just do. You know, Blackout was okay, but I'm kind of like, yeah, it wasn't that great on it. And I've got like zero care about wanting to play Mombasa. But, you know, Great Western Trail is the only one that I actively hate with a passion. You're going to burn in a very special level of hell. So much. Ninja cows, why? But, you know, getting off track. You know, so I do like his stuff. <laughs> you know, just certain types of stuff. You know, just some are a bit more extreme than others. But this one, I do like. I want to hang on to this one in my collection. And that's a big deal. You know, if I disliked it enough, it wouldn't be in my collection. But I want to play this more. I want to try out more of the campaign, like the later stuff. Because I haven't gone through the whole campaign, but I've certainly played a good chunk of it. But I want to play this with a similar group of people again, you know, because I want to see how the strategies evolve. And I want to do the multi-use card aspect, which I do enjoy a lot. So the game is fun. I just think it has a few issues that could have been ironed out, you know, could have been maybe streamlined a bit more or maybe just like, you know, maybe just made a bit more accessible to players without having people needing to discover for themselves what speed they really should be going around the map. Because believe me, the game really does self-destruct like a nuclear bomb that if you do not, like if everybody moves slow, it just will fall apart. But, you know, if, you, if somebody keeps the pace going, then the game actually does pretty well and gives me a good amount of enjoyment. So, all in all, I think this still deserves a decent 7 and a seal of endorsement from me. I enjoy it. I want to keep it in the collection and play it some more. Will it stand the test of time of the year? Maybe it'll get better over time as I play it with the same players more often. You know, but certainly I think that this is a solid game. I think you should check it out. You know, I think some people are going to easily put this as their top of 2019, 9 or 10. And I can see why. You know, some of the component and the graphic design issues, they're my opinion. Some of you might not care about them. Some of you might not even notice them. And you that's perfectly fine, your opinion. If you don't notice them or if they don't bother you, then great. There's one of the main negatives gone. <laughs> you know, you're going to love it at that point. You know, but I would argue that still some of the game balancing of like the quests and the combat could be answered a little bit more. But as I say, it's not game breaking. There's still plenty of ways to play the game. And it's still one that I like to bring out every now and again. And I would certainly be like, you know, oh, we want to play an Alexander Fister game. Oh, oh have you got Mara Kaibo? I would be happy to request it and I'd be more than happy to play it. I'll even break it out solo every now and again because I love playing with the multi-use cards that much. Forget the story, whatever, it's just there, it just changes up the board a little bit. I'm more interested in what am I going to do with these cards from a tactical and strategic point of view, you know, so even though it has some blemishes, I still enjoy this game.
okay. Everybody got that? So that's it for me for Admara Kaibo from Capstone Games. A solid entry for me, possibly even one of the best games of the year for many of you out there. Certainly, I would say if you're interested in this game, give it a try and see what you think. So that's it for me. I'll see you on the next Broken Beeple video. And whether you agree or disagree with this decision to the point where you want to nail me to a cross somewhere, it's still only a game. So chill, guys. Okay? Just chill. Take care, and I'll see you next time.